disgruntled and disillusioned and desperate man sits alone in his car, lost somewhere in the desert uh, in that sea of people known as California. Now, when I say California, I don't mean the glitzy wealth of Rodeo Drive and Beverly Hills. No, when I say California, I don't refer to the glamour and celebrity of Hollywood. Nay, I don't even refer to the coastal cities of San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco. No. I bring you this true tale from a desert, desolate land, a small town outside the armpit of that state, just outside of Bakersfield, in a little town that time and people have forgotten. The man, his name is Gary, sits alone and befuddled and confused, not sure where it is that life went so horribly wrong. In 2007, he'd lost his young wife to ovarian cancer. In 2009, amidst the American mortgage crisis, he lost his home and found himself hobbled in a small apartment that even to this day he could barely afford. And now in 2010, he's heard word that by the end of next month, he'll likely have lost his job as well. Where did it all go so wrong, he wondered. No one ever calls him except for telemarketers and collection agencies. Doesn't even know why he pays his cell phone bill. Angry and bitter, unsure of what to do, he sits in the car, trembling, nervously holding the only possession in his hand that he truly owns that the bank has no note on at all. A steel weapon handed down to him from his father who had inherited it from his grandfather before. Convinced that the only solution for all his problems in life, he cradles that steel weapon knowing that this will solve his problems at last. Surprisingly, he's not nervous about his next act. He finds his arm almost on automatic pilot, easily, readily, fluidly able to bring the weapon of choice up to his temple. As he closes his eyes and waits for the inevitable, suddenly the phone rings. An evil plot forms in his mind. The best revenge I can possibly have for all those collection agency people that call me every day. I'm going to let someone hear the misery of my life and guarantee them therapy forever. As part of this cruel joke, he answers the phone and puts it on speaker. And he hears this. Gary, it's Tim. Haven't seen you for the last couple Wednesdays. How you doing? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I come to you today with a message of good news and hope. Although it starts with a tale of misery and sorrow, I bring to this church your word, your foundation, your concept of church growth. Be with me in that endeavor. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. I know you've got questions. Brett, you're saying to yourself, which is a strange thing to say unless your name is Brett. Brett, you're saying, what do you mean by small groups? You're saying, 
what if I don't want to get involved in small groups? What if I don't know what God's hope for me is in small groups? And what about Gary? I'll tell you about Gary later. Is that okay? First, we're going to go through a few things. I'm just going to give you a brief history of small groups. This is not a new radical concept. This is not something invented by me. This is something that dates back to the Old Testament. Some have even said that the original small group was the Trinity. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who serves us even today. But I'm not going to get into philosophy of the Trinity today. I'm going to talk instead about small groups in our church here in the year 2016. I, although I have spent many hours reading doctoral thesis of several pastors who belong to different faith groups, I will promise you I'm going to bring it down to about 30 seconds of dialogue and the history of small groups in the modern era. I'm going to talk about the benefits of small groups and how we here at Henderson can see real change in our own lives as well as the community that I believe needs to hear about Jesus. I'm going to show you four ways to ensure intentional growth. I'm going to advise 10 ways to grow and replicate your small group once you feel empowered and committed to create one. And I'm going to warn you today, I'm going to have a call. This won't be a normal Billy Graham offering type, type of call, excuse me, um, spiritual type of call. This will be a call to action for some select leaders that want to Act upon what God is saying and touching your heart to do in creating small groups in our church. And finally, I'm going to invite Pastor Peter and Pastor Josue to the stage. By the way, they haven't been warned about this. I wanted to keep it fresh, so I didn't want to rehearse answers or questions with them. I'm going to invite them to the stage and have them help me in a call for action here for Henderson Church. Let's begin. Old Testament. How many know the story about Jethro? This is very interesting. Moses, at the time, is leading a group of Israel, people in Israel. How many people do you think there were in Israel? They're going out, they've escaped from Egypt. How many people do you think there were there? Do you know the Bible gives an answer to that? 605,380 men. That's just the men. When you add the women and the children, over 3 million people wandering in the desert under the leadership of one man. Do you sense frustration? Possibly. Do you sense a feeling of hopelessness? Perhaps. In fact, Moses in Deuteronomy cries out, what can one man do? In Exodus chapter 18, I think it's verse 21. Yes, here it is right here for you. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, Jethro gives him a plan, a model, tells him how to create leadership by breaking this large group into tribes and the tribes themselves into smaller divisions and those divisions again into smaller cells. And there's leaders for each of those. It's an excellent plan. And I think it's relevant even in 2016 today. This plan, as Jethro told Moses, not only will it work, but it will help you endure the pressures of leadership It'll ensure that you act alone as the people's representative for God, and it will ensure peace and harmony for all. If you don't believe me, go home today, read it yourself, Exodus chapter 18. Great advice, even from the Old Testament. New Testament. You ever heard about a guy named Peter? You like a guy named Paul? Sure. Both of these men modeled their house ministry based on what Jesus recommended. When Jesus was on this earth, one would possibly assume that he converted mass amounts of people. I mean, he's the king of kings. He's got to be the greatest evangelist around. He's Jesus Christ himself. Jesus did not convert and baptize a lot of folks. He delegated that work to his ministry and to his leaders, the disciples. Later on, as he went away to heaven, he ensured there was a plan for the apostles. Look in the book of Matthew. The message is clear. Jesus came to save. He's the one that actually does the redemption. I'm not taking anything away from that, of course. But he gives us the opportunity. He gives us the tools. He gives us the benefits of doing the action. I think it's just a wonderful plan. 
Matthew chapter 13, verses 44. And if you study Acts, and if you study 1 Corinthians, and if you study Philemon, you will see in all of these examples, the greatest, most effective work was done in small cell groups. House churches, they were called back then. Is that something that's relevant for today? I believe it is. I want you to fast forward now. I'm going to skip the 1700s and 1800s, which, by the way, very important time for small groups history. Martin Luther, in fact, employed this in his work when he was uh, working in Europe. And um, it's something that was later done quite effectively by John Wesley. But if you look at the 1980s and 1990s, that's when we see, at least in North America, an explosion of growth in terms of small cells. Studies have shown that the churches that are not stagnant, the churches that are growing, the churches that have dynamic speakers and dynamic members are the churches that meet not just once a week and listen to just one person from the pulpit, but instead effectively engage in a small cell group ministry. I'm pleased to say that we have some small groups here in our church. I'm going to step out on a limb here and chide my fellow members and say we do not yet have enough. <clears throat> What's a small group? Now, technically, if you read some of these thesis um, documents that are out there, you'll find that there is some subtle nuances between some of the names, but for the most part, common lay folk like yourself and like myself are going to interchangeably use the words small groups, cell groups, growth groups, life groups, home groups, care groups, study groups, and connect groups. Here's what I'm going to do. When you agree or volunteer to be a leader of one of these groups, I'm going to let you call it whatever you want. It's pretty nice of me, isn't it? Actually, there's five models of the cell group, cell group concept. I'm going to share these five with you. We're actually engaged in a couple of them already, and I'm going to let you explore and discover and see which would be most effective for our church. The first model is called the covenant model. Now, this was brought about in the late 70s by a lady named Roberta Hestens. I've put it on the screen for you. You don't need to take notes. Just send me an email. I'll send you the PowerPoint. Um, Roberta, a saintly woman, kind of reminds me of an Ivy James. Is Ivy James here today? She gets embarrassed when I do this, so I can talk about her when she's gone. That's good. <laughs> Roberta is like an Ivy James, God-fearing soul. She's right behind Enoch, the next one to be translated, I'm telling you. But her concept of a cell group or a, a study group was a closed cell group. It was designed for those who already have a commitment with Jesus Christ, those who have existing, strong, dedicated, biblical-focused types of minds who are intentionally wanting to limit their goals simply to spiritual growth and enhancement, edification, if you will, for the existing members of the church. Is there anything wrong with this type of group? No. But will this group rescue the rest of Winnipeg? No. This type of group which, in fact, we have in our own church today, exists excellent for, um, in cases when we want to have care groups or prayer bands and things of that nature. And I applaud those like Ivy and Sylvia, and I shouldn't have mentioned names because I'm going to miss a few already, but those of you who are already engaged in this type of internal, in-focus ministry, I applaud you. I think God is happy that you're doing that kind of ministry. Here's another model. It's called the serendipity model. This was brought about by Lyman Colon in the early 1970s. In fact, Lyman was friends with a man who was a reverend in a church in New York, and that man's name was Sam Shoemaker. I'm not making this up, seriously. His name was Sam Shoemaker. And guess what Sam did for a living? No, he was a pastor. Come on, that's the thing about church growth, guys. He was not a shoemaker. Sam had a church in the middle of New York City, one of the poorer parts of New York City, and he believed that the reason people weren't coming to church because they didn't sense they had a need for church. And so what he did was he made services and ministries available to the immediate neighborhood. He paced out six blocks to the west, six blocks to the east, six blocks to the north, six blocks to the south, and that was his little mission field. 
And he ensured that everyone in that neighborhood knew that his church offered a small group. And that small group did not study the Bible for the first three years. That group had food banks before food banks were popular. That group handed out clothing. Perhaps Sam knew of Dorcas work in Bible times. I don't know. That group worked to help people get jobs, help people to fix their cars, help people to make sure that kids had shoes on their feet so they could go to school. And if you asked one of those neighbor kids, did they go to church, they'd say, of course I go to church. And Sam's my pastor. And yet they had never yet set foot in the church where he was the pastor. I would propose that we are also engaged in this type of ministry. It has its place. A wonderful work that we do with ACS. I think of people like Margaret and Agnes de Bryden, dedicated, committed people. If you've got a Wednesday afternoon with nothing to do, no, better yet, make a Wednesday afternoon with nothing to do. Help out these two ladies. They're doing soup kitchens. They're handing out clothing. They're doing Bible studies. These people... They're actually doing what all of us should be doing. They're using the serendipity model. Let's move on. There's also the meta model. This is by Carl George. Now, Carl George, late 1980s, um, designed a concept called an open cell group, and it was designed on simple third world concepts, but adapted to North America. The reason why, he had actually spent about 21 or 22 years of his life in places like India and Sri Lanka, places where there was no such thing as a church for a couple reasons. Number one, Christianity was not very popular in those regions. And number two, people couldn't afford to build bricks and mortar, stones and pews and pulpits. They're meeting under trees. They're out in fields. Guess what they found? If there was at least two or three of them there, who was there? God was there. They had church, but they needed something besides just church. So this open cell group would um, <clears throat> actually take Jethro's advice from Moses there. And they would actually delegate tasks to each of the people in the village. So you might have a village of 200 people. 200 people that, by the way, were staunch Muslims or Sikhs or Buddhists or different types of religions officially on the books. But they were engaged every week in Christian small cell groups. Why? Because the churches met their needs. The small group reached out beyond just once a week and said, how can I serve you the way Jesus has served me. I love that model. That's a very effective model as well. That's something that we could do here in Winnipeg, or we could consider the next one. This is the Cho model, invented by Yuki Cho. If you Google him, you can see there's at least two books that he's written on this. He's a gentleman from Korea, um, very, very challenging doing um, Christian ministry in Korea, but he was very effective. Spent 12 years there, and then came to North America. This is an open cell design group as well. It's designed to expand upon the weekly church pulpit message. So here, his model was, everyone's got to come to church first. He would happen to go to a Sunday church. Everyone's got to come to church every Sunday. You listen to my sermon. He was the pastor there. And then you break into different groups. And on Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday or whatever night you had, you would share a meal with someone. You would talk about a service mission project you wanted to take on. And you would do a Bible study. But the Bible study was limited to that Sunday's message. Do you hear me? Do you see a problem with us trying to do that one? Exactly. We don't meet on Sundays. No. We could do that one too, of course, right? You just take Sabbath message. All right? Pastor Peter or Pastor Josue, they, they deliver a message. And that Wednesday, your group of six, eight, nine people in your neighborhood would further expound or discuss that. And we can make that easy for you. Because a couple things. Number one, we upload all those sermons to the website so it's accessible to you in your home. Number two, we can make notes or PowerPoint presentations for you to share with your family or your friends or your neighbors. And we can ensure that this model is effective and available for you for doing your own home ministry. And then there's the fifth model. I call this the church growth model. 
Joel Kaminsky, and if you're really, one night you just can't sleep, you're tired and you can't sleep, go read his doctoral thesis from 1992. Oh my goodness. But I did glean a few good things out of it. <clears throat> this is an open cell group designed to be church growth oriented and acts as a pragmatic servant to the church. This is not a rebellious group. I'm not encouraging people to stop attending church. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to let you know that God wants you to be focused on Him more than just Sabbath. He wants you telling your friends and neighbors who might be out tobogganing today, couldn't make it here this morning, He wants you to tell them on Wednesday what God has done for you. And you can do that by starting your own small cell group. It's a servant of the church. It's flexible in format. What do I mean by that? Let's say, um, I'm going to pick on someone who's here today. Is uh, Nikki Foster here today? She's here. Okay. Hi, Nikki, wherever you are. There you go. Nikki's cell group may be 90 minutes long every Wednesday. The first 30 minutes, they do a workout. Okay? They're, they're doing aerobics and all that good stuff that I should be doing, but she's doing more of it than me. Then they spend five minutes talking about the amazing race. And then they get into God's Word. And it's a weekly format. They, the people go there because they want exercise of their body and they want spiritual touch on their heart. They bond with Nikki. Someone like Gilles Landry. Is Gilles Gilles here? Gilles, are you here? Gilles Landry, have you seen this guy do woodworking? Have you seen his, his woodworking? You've got to go to his house for lunch sometime. The food's good too, Lana. It's delicious. But the table, look at the table. The woodworking is amazing. He's done it all by himself. Gilles Landry could have a weekly cell group, a small group, every week that spends the first 30 to 45 minutes talking about woodworking. I will not come to that group. I'm sorry. But you might want to. More importantly, your neighbor might want to. After the 30 minutes talking about woodworking, we talk about the greatest carpenter of all, Jesus Christ himself, who could not only form things out of wood, but could change a person's life. That's the kind of small group I'm talking about. I could go on, <clears throat> but I won't. The cell group just needs to focus on four main things. I put a bonus one up here for you, but the first one is worship. The second one starts with an I. Um, I'll find it later here on the screen. <clears throat> Uh, let's talk about the service model, first of all. Here's what I like to do. I like to, I like to memorize things by, by acronyms. Maybe you do the same? Y-E-S? I mean, yes? Okay. So, <clears throat> what I want in my small group to accomplish, to achieve for Jesus, and to impact others in Winnipeg, is I want a group that focuses on service. Okay? Let's see, I already see Trevor taking a picture of the screen. This says two things to me. He wants to be a leader of a small group, and that's fantastic. I always call him Travis instead of Trevor. It is Trevor, right? Eh? All right. It is Travis. It... What I really call him is the people from Oklahoma. But anyway, <laughs> he told me I have to start calling him by his name now. I'm going to give you the PowerPoint, okay? Because I think you want to be a leader, and I'm proud to say I'm your friend and that you are, are, are wanting to accomplish that. And here's what I hope your group will do. I hope your group will have this acronym in mind. We create a small group that is spiritual in nature, that has on its heart a desire for evangelism, that wants to reproduce. What do you mean by that, Brett? Let me be careful. Your group, which may start out with as little as four people, should never get larger than 16 people. And that's not just because your living room can only handle 16 people. No, it's because Jesus has created a model that suggests that's the best, most uh, impactful way to intimately relate to one another in this small group environment. Oh, Brett, what if I'm so successful and with Jesus' help, I get my group growing even larger? What do I do? What do we do? We start another group. This entire church can be made up of small groups. I want a group that's focused on volunteerism. In this era, this time where we're always thinking about money and gaining wealth and buying cars and properties, is that just me? Oh, okay. When we're so materialistic, we need to focus on someone else. We need to volunteer our time. We need to donate our money. We need to ensure that our service 
goes for something not so selfish as just us. I'd like to see a group create an internal mission project, and that could be something simple. You wanna, your group wants to pick up litter on Highway 1. We'll put a sign on there that says, brought to you by small cell group number 5 at Henderson Highway. Hopefully you'll come up with a better name than number 5. We want you to feel that you have a desire to make a change in Winnipeg. You want to impact the city and its citizens. Pick projects that will do that. We can achieve that. I know we can. Show that you care. And of course, extended compassion there. I'll let you read this when I send you the PowerPoint presentation. There's more details that I can share with you there. So Brett, what are the benefits? Why do small groups work well within large churches? Do you understand, when I say large churches, we may think that we're a large church because we're the largest one in the conference, right? Large churches in many North American cities are churches that have three, four, maybe 5,000 people sitting in the audience on Sunday morning. They're listening to a guy who smiles, he's got the perfect makeup, he's got the TV crew happening. Sorry, I couldn't do that this morning, I just totally ran out of time. He's got everything polished. It's down to a media science. If you're sitting in the pew that week, and you're hurting because you lost your job, you're worried because you don't know how to make your next car payment, you don't know what's going to happen with your family and your house, and you're worried about the economy, and you're not sure exactly what God has in store for you, are you going to be able to hear that pastor who's blaring out to TV media land and talking to 3,000 other people in the pews, are you going to be able to have a meaningful, personal, intimate response to those questions you've just asked? Probably not. May I suggest you don't give up. Don't walk away Sabbath morning saying, well, that didn't affect me. That church service meant nothing. Instead, bond with someone in your own church. Create your own family. Let's call it, I don't know, a small group and share with each other that way. Small groups are very effective because they're actually excellent entry points into the church. There are people who attend small groups for three, four, five years and have yet to come into the church that sponsors it. And I say, that's okay. It's also an effective evangelism tool. I have nothing against the excellent evangelists that we have in our conference, we have in our division, we have globally. I've sponsored some of them myself personally. I've encouraged you folks to get on board as we've brought some in there. But if I have to spend $90,000 out of my personal ministry budget of $5,000 every year, I have a problem, don't I? Oh, sure, I can get conference support. Sure, the SD Church in Canada will kick in money as well. But what if for free, we had a small group evangelism tool that actually worked? Could we try it? I say we could. Ability to care for participants. The confidentiality thing, the bonding that happens is just magical. The problem solving that occurs when just eight people focus on helping one another. It's just amazing what can happen. It accelerates spiritual growth. Do you know that we've got people who have been members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 50 years? They'll sit there and sing their hearts out every Sabbath. They'll quote any scripture you want. You talk to them in private and they'll tell you they're spiritually dry. They're emotionally dead. They're hurting inside and no one seems to care. In a small cell group, that kind of thing is observed. The body language is understood. The confidentiality, the secrets are shared, and people impact each other because they have a desire to help. And most importantly, I think Pastor Peter and jo Pastor Jose will like this one. Small cell groups, guess what, guys? We as the members get to take control. Oh, yes, I know. You're used to the model, which we've done for 150 years, where we pay a pastor, way too little, by the way, and we expect him or her to do all the work to rescue all of the world and to ensure salvation for each and every one of us. It's not going to happen. You want to know why pastors get burned out? You want to know why pastors hurt? You want to know why pastors are in pain? 
because they have all these expectations thrust upon them with no hope at all of being able to achieve what it is that members want, what boards demand, what conferences expect. I'm suggesting we relieve these gentlemen of the burdens of concern for evangelism by taking on a good chunk of the responsibility ourselves. Is that too much to ask? Member powered. We can be empowered. All right, let's close. <clears throat> Some people want to know, Brett, I don't know the first thing about cell, small cell groups. Well, you know a little bit if you've been listening. I'll give you tons of material. I'll ensure you sign up to newsletters that are put out by 3ABN. Our own Adventist church is big into this at the top level. I don't see it filtering down to the level of the masses here. And um, I'm suggesting we should make use of those tools that are there. But here's the reality. According to a Gallup poll, and when I show you these six things, this doesn't just mean what people want out of church small groups. This is what people want out of life. This is your friend and neighbor, you know, the one that lets his dog go all over your yard, the one you don't like. He's got these six concerns. You know the coworker that steals your paper clips and your pencil all the time, tries to sneak in and see your password? She's got those same six needs. This has nothing to do about church ministry. But we as small group leaders can capture this and implement it so that it is. Watch, number one. People want to believe that life has meaning. What's my purpose? Why am I here? It's a question everyone asks. I don't care if you're a God-fearing Christian or if you're an atheist. You, at some point in time in your life, will ask the question, what am I doing here? Where did I come from? What's the purpose of my life? Number two, people demand, desire, crave, if you will, the opportunity to engage in relationships, to share commitments with one another. We can meet that need. Number three, people want to feel they've been appreciated and respected. People want to see evidence that someone listens, that someone hears. And yes, there is a difference. Okay? I can listen to my wife. Sorry, sorry my mistake. I can hear my wife. And, and forget all the instructions she told me. But if I listen, I know why I need to do it. I know how quickly I need to get it done. I know how to do it. I already know in advance how wrong I'm going to do it. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can read into it when you genuinely listen, not just hear. People want that. Number five, they want to feel that they're seeing a change in their life, some growth. People don't want to stagnate. They want to improve. We can offer that. And number six, they want to get help in their belief development and maturity. Again, this message is clear for atheists as well as Christians. Everyone has a belief system. It may not be in God. Everyone has a belief system. People want that belief system to be validated. They want to be able to grow and mature as they form their own thoughts about that belief system, as they continue to challenge it. A small cell group can offer that. It's important that we understand these six things. If we can address these six things, then we can start a small cell group right here in Winnipeg. We can start 12 of them. We can start 18 of them. We can actually have small cell groups here in Winnipeg. All right, so once my group is started, how do I make it grow? Ask me for the PowerPoint, I'll send it to you. We're running out of time here. But here's the four important things. It's funny, Jenny said to me, we gotta get going, we gotta get this program going, we're gonna run out of time. I said, wait a minute, it's Sabbath, where are you going on Sabbath? I have no place to go, I can't work, can't earn money. I can talk about Jesus though. I've got the next two hours ready for you. <laughs> we were also in the back here today <clears throat> I was realizing I didn't have any notes. My printer doesn't work at home, so I thought I'm going to have to wing this one. And so I was talking, kind of a little bit nervous. I see Ingrid walk in. Didn't she do a phenomenal job in the scripture? I just love it. Ingrid, thank you so much. <clears throat> so when Ingrid first walks in, she's saying hello to everybody, you know, kind of polite and shy like kids are, right? And she says hello, and I said, hello, Ingrid, Ingrid, <clears throat> Ingrid. My voice.
voice is not very good today. Can you and I swap? <laughs> Should have seen the look of terror in her face. <laughs> now, having said that, having said that, we give too little credit for our young kids. I'm willing to wager that Ingrid could have done today's presentation. Okay? And here's the thing. I will give you the tools to do your own small cell group. I will not leave you hanging. You come up and tell me, Brett, I want to be a leader. I want to answer Jesus' call. I want to actually impact people's lives. I will not leave you hanging. I will give you the tools. If the tools I give you you don't like, I will find new tools. If the tools that we try to find are still not satisfactory, Jesus himself will deliver you with tools. He tells you he will not abandon you. He will not leave you alone. Here's what I want you to do when you create your groups. I want you to create four important things. This is hugely important. Number one, it has to be a safe environment. People have to feel comfortable sharing. That means that when you start your group, there may be, there may be times when there's not the right chemistry, and that's okay. But if we've only got one small group in our church, and people only have one choice, that's a problem. But if we, as Pastor Peter and Pastor Josue and I envision, if we have 18 cell groups in this church, we've got lots of choices for our members. You see what I'm saying? Once that chemistry is there, people are going to bond. People are going to want to share. People are going to feel safe in that environment. Number two, I want you to make sure that if you have a curriculum, not all small cell groups do, but if you have a curriculum, you need to be willing to ensure that that curriculum meets members' needs. Nikki's curriculum on her group, should she choose to do this, Nikki's curriculum on her group is going to likely be different than any curriculum that Dave Keenan's going to design because the needs of the members are different. Am I right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, I just thought I lost you for a minute. Number three, I want you to remain open to the Holy Spirit's impressions. The way your group starts today may be different than what it is six months from now because the Holy Spirit himself directed you to change. Can you be open to change? I'm a man. I'm not very good at change. But if I ask Jesus' help, he will ensure I change. Am I correct? Number four, I want you to move from knowledge to application. You can know the Bible inside and out. You can memorize every single scripture, but if you don't apply it, it means nothing. What does Jesus say? Through Paul. I can clang like a noisy gong, but if I have no love, I have not Jesus within me. Let's teach, but let's utilize the things that are taught. So we move from knowledge to application, okay? Ten quick things I'm going to just show you here on how to grow your group. Um, I want you to be clear about your focus. I want you to make sure you have a good teacher, facilitator. Oh, Brett, don't say that. I was just so close. I was willing to go on the stage and say, I'm going to be a leader, and now you say, i got to be a good one. <laughs> don't do that to me, Brett. I'm not asking you to stand up on stage and present a sermon. I'm asking you, in the intimacy of your own home, to simply be a facilitator. The most important job of the facilitator may simply be this. Ensuring some snacks are available. Ensuring that the carpet's been vacuumed the night before. There's a clean spot on the couch where the dog doesn't leave any hair. Boom, you're done. You may delegate, just like Jethro told Moses to do, someone within your group to do the personal ministry part, to do the outreach, to do the mission work, to do the Bible study. Oh, and there's one other thing I'll ask you to do. The tools that I give you, including a DVD, you might have to push the power button. I want you to enlist leaders who have a desire to grow, not leaders who want to be closed-celled, closed-minded, closed-faithed. No, I want people who are saying, hey, we've got four people today, can't wait till we get eight. And after eight, I want 16. And after 16, I want to ensure that one of my leaders that I've trained in my group can break off and form another cell group as well. That's the kind of leaders I'm looking for. And I think there's leaders right in this audience today that are going to tell me they can do that. Be aware of the 80% rule. Do you know what the 80% rule is? And I don't know about other cultures, but here in North America, we, we like our space. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> when you get to the point where your home and the participants that visit you 
have occupied more than 80% of free available space, it's time to start a new group, okay? That 16 figure I gave you is not hard and solid and fast. For you, if you've got a smaller home, it may be at 12. Start a new group, okay? Use name tags for members and guests. I I've seen this before where only the name tag is only given to um, a visitor. Oh, hi, welcome. We're going to let you have a, a name tag so we can all identify you and say hi to you during the Bible study. That's great. But what if the visitor doesn't know who you are, right? Everybody should have a name tag. Always have extra copies of the curriculum. You ever done this? You got eight people that come up. Last 32 weeks in a row, eight people have been coming to your small cell group, and you've got a lesson study on the book of Mark or Ephesians or whatever you're doing that, that quarter. Suddenly, for the first time in 18 weeks, someone new shows. Oops, I didn't have any extra curriculum. Make extra copies, okay? If you can't do that, call me up. I'll make the copies for you, okay? Make extra copies. Make sure everyone gets some of the curriculum. I want you to train a pastoral team within your group. I have to tell you right now, I'm okay standing on a stage and talking in public. I, I do this for a living, okay? I'm okay doing administration details and making sure that money and finances work. Ask me to care about somebody. I'm not so good at that. Those of you who have had chances where I have cared for you, I I'm going to confess right now, sometimes I fake it. I really, I'm sorry. I I it's just the way I am. So find someone other than me in your group to be the one that's doing the actual caring, okay? Number nine, enlist a group of outreach leaders for your projects. The group can't be internally focused. The group needs to be outward. The group needs to know that there's other people out there that want to be part of a group. Have someone designated in your group to be a leader of that team. And then I want you to pray for people. Now, everyone tells you all the time, oh, I always pray. We have eight people in our group, and every week I pray for eight people. Here's a suggestion. Do you know of three people that you wish would join your group? Forget the eight people. They're already coming. Pray for the three that you wish would come. That's just a suggestion. All right. I warned you there was going to be a call. And I'm going to make that call today. Before I do that, though, I'm going to ask Pastor Peter. Are, are you in the audience today? I guess I should have checked first. Pastor Peter, can you come here, please? Pastor Joel Sway, come, come forward, please. Now, <clears throat> oh, I'm going to be really brave. I'm going to pick a layperson. John, can you come forward, please? <clears throat> I love John. J John just ran to church a little while ago. You know that, right? John and Mary, if you want a really good potluck, go to their house. Oh, South American food is just amazing. Pick their cell group if you're going to go to a group. <clears throat> now, I'm going to get a microphone here. Guys, don't kill me. I purposely did not rehearse this because I didn't want your answers to sound stiff. <clears throat> stiff. I didn't want your answers to sound rehearsed. I'm just going to ask you some questions. I want you to be blunt with me. Even at the risk of your answers totally going against everything I've said in today's presentation. That would be worrisome. All right, first thing I'm going to do. John, can I ask you a question? Sure. <clears throat> I've heard a rumor. Is it true? You need to be a member of this church for 20 years before you can start your own small cell group. Is that true? I guess I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> we haven't been a member here for a year yet, and we have a small group. I'll be at work in my mortgage office, 9 o'clock at night or whatever, right? John's texting me. Brett, give me some advice. I got some guy asking questions. So, of course, you know what I do? I call Pastor Peter. You're right. No, just kidding. No. I, I stop my mortgage work. I look in my Bible. I help John find answers. Did I not tell you I'd give you tools? I'm going to support you folks. And when it gets too big for me to do on my own, I'm going to get Jonathan to support you. I'm going to get Dave to support you, unless they're too busy forming their own groups. We're going to give you the tools. We're going to give you the backup. John, tell us an experience here. What kind of things do you do at your group? We study the Bible. We uh, are right now in the middle of uh, dissecting Daniel. And I got to tell you, John asks tough questions. I know what you guys are thinking. I've been a member for this church for 38 years. What if someone asks me a question? I don't know the answer. Let me just warn you up front. It's going to happen, okay? And it's okay. The correct response is not to be defensive, especially if it's someone from another church, another faith. Don't be defensive and say, oh, well, our church has a better answer than yours. No. How about this? You know, I don't know the answer, but together 
you and I, we can study and learn. It works. Anything else you want to share, John? Is there food at your house, too? Pardon? Do you do the food thing, too? Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. Good. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> Pastor Josue, can I ask you some questions? No. Oh, he said he could say anything. He says no. Um, it's my understanding that you have a small cell group, but that I'm too old to attend that group. Can you tell us about it? Well, we have the, the fireplace, which is the first Friday of every month, and um, the young adults, they come over. Just show of hands. Uh, have any young adults ever gone to this program? Oh. Okay, yeah. in the back. Okay, good. All right. And do you teach them to sit in the back every week? Is that what you do? Okay. <laughs> All right. What kind of thing goes on at the fireplace? I'm sorry, is it called the fireplace? Fireplace, What, yeah. what kind of things go on at the fireplace? Well, it's not a typical Bible study. Like, we don't get too serious right away. It's just not very structured. And that's okay. But uh, we, we just chat. We, we um, talk about... Um, some current events, then some things that we're into in the, in the future, then we have snacks. Uh, we have some kind of Bible study discussions. They, they, we, we do have discussions, but it's not extremely um, rigid. rigid. Here, here's what I love about Pastor Joel Sway. And I, I must admit, I have not attended his um, small groups, uh, but I have talked to him enough and texted him enough uh, to understand how he thinks. And this is what I love. If Pastor Josue's presentation or planned presentation in early January, if it had been on the book of Ephesians, how to grow a church, Pastor Josue is flexible enough, unlike some of us old guys, that when the news media splashed all over the headlines this terrible series of events in Paris, I'm willing to wager that night's presentation started out with, what's going on in the world? Why are all these things happening, not just in Paris, but everywhere else? What impact does terrorism have on me as a young person here in North America? Am I right? Was some of that happening? If it wasn't, that's okay. You can say no. Uh, honestly, I don't remember. Oh, he doesn't remember. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you, as a compliment to my friend and my pastor here, Pastor Josue is the type of person that is so flexible in the design and the nature of his small group, he can do that. Some of you might say, I can't do that, Brett. Uh, no, I can't. Give me 12 lessons, I promise. I'll have four people at my house every night for 12 weeks. I just tell me which button to push, and I'll do it. And that's okay, too. Yes? Actually, we have a second small group. It's called the Situation Room. And that is led by the young adults. It's on Fridays. And last night, it was Cormac who had it. And in the Situation Room, we do like a CNN. Okay. They have the Situation Room, and they discuss events are happening. So to, last night it was about the Syrian refugees and Cormac did the whole Bible study of very well prepared. Wow. So we do have awesome. that small group that is on Fridays, the third Friday of the month, okay. specific for what's going on on the news. Wow. Cormac, Molina, all you young people out there, do you guys have, what are those newfangled things called? Uh, I, you have an iPhone? You, you have one of those little phones? Does it have a video camera on it? Take some pictures for us. Shoot some movies. We're, we're going to watch. We're going to come some week here, and we're going to see the amazing things that you guys are doing in your ministry. Will you promise me you'll do that? Working on it? Good. Thank you. I got a commitment. Thank you. Pastor Peter. Tantra in the Holy Land is a series uh, that lasts six months. Uh, you meet once a week in a small cell group setting, and it's pretty much hosting your, as you were mentioning here, being a host is not that you are taking majors, more facilitating than doing things because everything is recording on DVD. And recordings, that presentation, it's usually our Seventh-day Adventists believe, but illustrated with some uh, pictures from Israel. They went there and shoot some shots over there about the things that they are talking, events where Jesus preached, uh, buildings and things like that. So it makes very interesting visual uh, aspects. So for 25 minutes, you are watching that, and after that, you are having a small discussion, closing in the prayer, and you go home and meet next week. But each time, one of the doctrinal truths is presented in those presentations for six months, once a week. And then, at the end, the presenter, who is actually it is Rick and speaker, Chris Holland, they be watching him every, with your friends, you're watching with them at home every week. And then at the end of this six months period, he comes here for eight day events, reaping events, where all those who've been attending, your friends, are invited to come to church and see the speaker alive. Okay, so are you hearing this? 
thank you for stealing my thunder in the Holy Land. Okay, so here's, what, here's the beautiful thing about this, all right? Oftentimes, how do we do evangelism um, ministries in most cases? We hire a guy to come from somewhere we've never heard, and we never see him again. Am I correct? I mean, bless their hearts, that's their job. They go around city to city, that's their job. But oftentimes, we actually see a guy for 21 days straight, and that's it. We've done minimal preparation to start. There's minimal follow-up to end. Even Brother John will tell you that. Now, John and Mary do still text and email um, our great pastor from um, Darren. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Um, uh, did I tell you we sometimes forget? <laughs> you know, they come and they go, and that's it. Here's what I love about this thunder in the Holy Land. We are actually investing time and resources so that Chris from It Is Written will go down to his studio, I think it's in Memphis, Tennessee, he will record a, a, a whole series, six months worth of these DVDs that are going to be placed into your hands that you can have in your home, okay? He will create this beautifully, a, a powerful message. It's already been proven effective with other ministers before. The concept is intriguing. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's um, like a travel log when you look at the Holy Land, but it's also spiritual value as well. He will record those, and you are going to see them in your home with friends and coworkers and neighbors. And then when I ask you guys in early 2017, can you think of someone to invite to the evangelistic series, which, by the way, is going to be led by Chris from It Is Written, how many of you will have at least one person to bring? Sure you will. It's the people in your group. And here's another benefit. In your group, you meet on Wednesdays, let's say. While you're meeting on Wednesdays, and you share with Chris there, you can also tell him as they go home. If you want to see more, watch Chris on TV. He's on every Sunday morning. Saturday. Yeah. I am a Sabbath keeper. So. He's on every Saturday. So, there's that bond there. There's that ability to ensure that we're already in advance growing there. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Now, the stage is empty. I don't need you to come on the stage, but I do need to see at least a show of hands, at least someone willing to stand, at least someone willing to say, Brett, I get it. You've talked way too long. It's okay to say that. You've talked way too long. Yeah, I noticed my early teens guys are all raising their hand on that one. It's time to call for action. And that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to tell you what happened to Gary. But here's the catch. You're not going to hear about Gary unless I see some volunteers. Call me evil, but I got the mic today. <laughs> Is there at least one that would willingly host in their home a simple meal and the use of their DVD to play for other members of this church as well as neighbors and co-workers that want to learn more about Jesus? Is there at least one who would be a leader today? Thank you, Harry. Thank you, John. You're going to continue to do the ministry you've done. Thank you, Trevor Travis from Oklahoma. <laughs> Pastor Josue, thank you for continuing the two gospels that you're doing, the two programs that you're doing, sharing the gospel. Is there another? Now, I'm seeing some timid hands here. I want to see some people stand, which, by the way, will work out very nicely for our closing song. Are there a few more that would say, Brett, I know that the people in Saskatoon, the people who root for the Rough Riders, had 19 small cell groups in their church. Surely we in Winnipeg can do better. Can I get at least 19 of those groups? I've got six so far I've seen. I've, I've got another, seven. Send me an email, brettdobbin at gmail.com. It's B-R-E-T, my family couldn't afford both. B-R-E-T-D-O-B-B-I-N at gmail.com. Say, Brett, I was touched by your message. I want the PowerPoint presentation. I want access to all the tools you have in exchange for volunteering my home to be part of your small cell group vision. Will you do that? And now I'm going to tell you about Gary. Gary is still alive and well today. I so very much wish that Tim, the guy that called, 
was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I so much desire that Tim, the guy that called and changed Gary's mind from taking his life, was the leader of a small group of any Christian church. But I'm going to confess to you now. Tim was the catcher for the company's softball team. That's it. Tim didn't know anything about the Bible. Tim didn't worship God. But Tim saved a life that day. Gary's life has been changed forever because someone cared. Someone heard him. Someone listened to him. Someone appreciated him. Someone respected him. Someone told him, I missed you last two Wednesdays. Won't you come out for next week's softball game? Folks, I'm going to suggest today that the stakes are much higher than a corporate softball team. We're talking life and death, eternal life. And here's the beauty. You've got a chance to be part of it. Make that commitment. Prove me wrong. Just try your best. When I say you could save a life, you could change a life.